Hey there, Diocese of the Rio Grande. I know you know Corrine Hodges, who is the vicar of the Church of the Holy Family here in Santa Fe. Corrine, you have been serving here how long? Six years. It'll be the first Sunday of Advent. It'll be exactly six years. Wonderful. Yep. And before that, let's go back to kind of like how did you how did you know God was calling you to the priesthood? What was that like? Oh, if you're going back that far. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, actually, I started with a call to chaplaincy. So I was a Roman Catholic, and I was bringing communion to uh, nursing home residents and the homebound, and little prayer groups started to evolve. And I loved that so much that I would go and I'd visit like 14 people each Sunday, and I said, I wonder if there's a career, you know, a vocation where I could do this all the time instead of just Sundays after church. And so I did some research and I found this thing called chaplaincy. And I thought, well, I'm gonna, what I'll do is I will interview three chaplains. And years before this, I had thought I'd be a baker. So I went and I interviewed three bakers. And I asked them if they would do it all over again. They all said no. Did they really? They said the hours were terrible, the pay was terrible, you never get vacation, no. So needless to say, I never went to baking school. But then I interviewed three different chaplains and they all loved it. And they all said they would do it over again in a second. And um, I did a nine month CPE unit right away, like right at the beginning of seminary instead of waiting halfway. And I really loved it. And so I knew that I wanted to help people grow closer to God and specifically bring communion. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. But you were Roman Catholic. I was Roman Catholic. So that's an obstacle. Yeah, and so I was Irish Catholic. Roman Catholic. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. and, and multi-generations? This, yeah. is deep, this was yeah. deep in you. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was. So, but my mom um, is from Germany, and so she was Lutheran, and she had a lot of pressure to try to convert, and she did not. She felt, you know, that was the one thing she hung on from her native country. And um, then I married a Methodist. So... All one day a light bulb went off, you know, my whole life, my mom could not receive communion and she had to stay in the pew while my dad and my brother and I would go up to receive. And then I married a Methodist in the same thing and I just thought that Jesus, you, you know, intended communion to bring people together versus divide people. And in my family, it was dividing them. And once, it was just once that light bulb went off, I just couldn't deny it. And so we started to go to an Episcopal church, and that became our home. And I remember when my parents joined us the first Easter, and all of us had communion, and it was just so powerful. You know, it's, that had never happened. What was it like for your mom? I mean, did you ever talk about that? Or? Yeah, I mean, she was thrilled. She never thought that day would ever, would ever happen. Yeah. You know, and my dad said, "Oh, we should have done this years ago." You know, so um, but it was hard letting go of those Irish Catholic roots. Mm -hmm. Mike was actually, my husband was yes. earlier, he was ready way before I was to be confirmed. I was kind of resistant because of that history. The history and the tradition of yeah. that in your family. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then you've been a priest for quite some time. I was ordained in 07, I finished seminary in 06, but because I was Roman Catholic, it took a, I just had an extra year. And I did, um, for seminary, I did two years at Loyola, and then I did three years at Seabury Western. So I did five years part-time because I was hired right after my um, CPE unit to be a chaplain in a retirement community, a Presbyterian uh, retirement community. So I was working and going to seminary and going through discernment, and what was really cool is I could apply what I learned in the classroom to my vocational work and then vice versa. Like tomorrow. Yeah, right? and yeah. when I wrote case studies and things, like I had real cases. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, so it was great. Yeah, it was fun. really great. And I, I would have guessed that you loved being a chaplain and I did. You know, working with the elderly folk too. Yeah, and their families and you know, I ended up doing the weddings of their grandchildren and and all of that. So it was it was a good <laughs> ministry and then I ended up um, getting hired as that top position. So then I started supervising other clergy and mentoring younger clergy. And that was, that's been a lot of fun. 
And so yeah. then after ordination, did you continue in chaplaincy? Or tell me how, tell, tell us about your... Yeah, that was kind parish. of crazy because, you know, I was told I needed to have an altar even though I had, was chaplaincy. So, and when you're a chaplain, especially where I was, you work 24-7, 365, you get calls all the time. And I would also cover for the hospital chaplain. Wow. So... Was this in Indiana? This was actually in Chicago. Chicago? Chicago. Yeah. Okay. And um, then, you know, that, and then I was uh, helping out at St. Elizabeth's in Glencoe, which you probably know. I do. Yeah. That, with the chaplaincy, was a lot for one person. Uh, and then Mike, my husband, um, he received a new job in Indiana. And uh, I met the bishop there, and I really didn't want to leave Chicago. And I met the bishop there, and he said, Oh, Corrine, I wonder if you'd consider talking to this little church by the border of Michigan. And I felt like I had to at least be open. And I interviewed, and I walked into this church that was St. John of the Cross, almost 175 years old. And the pews were made out of the walnut trees. That church was on used to be a walnut grove, so those trees were used for the pews, and all the parishioners, a lot of them were in the trades, so carpenters, and I mean, they, it was it was just lovely. And I remember when the senior warden opened the doors, and I stepped in, and I literally, I wept, and I said, I, I have to do this, yeah. you know. Oh, wow. But it was in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Far away from your home? I mean, did you have to drive? So we, we moved to Indiana, and yeah. I had to drive an hour each way to church there. Okay. Um, and the, literally, it was a very, very, very small town, one intersection, and the church was right down the road. And the first time I went there, I called up my husband. I said, oh my gosh, you know, I can't believe this. And he just calmed me down. And, you know, but when I was inside that church, I knew, I just knew I had to do this. Yeah. Yeah. I often in working with search committees, the search committee thinks, well, we can just do all the interviews online and all that kind of thing. And you have to keep reminding them. Until the priest walks into your place, she won't know. Yeah. Because yeah. there's a spiritual reality yeah. that, that the Holy Spirit yeah. will say. Yeah. Even if you thought, like you did, like, no way. But right. sometimes you walk into a place where you sit down it's on the back street and it's like, there you go. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Or the opposite. I've had that experience myself where, like, everything looked great until I walked into the building with her. And I was like, this is not, it was like rubber bands. Well, no, and that's kind of like it's here because you know this is a very unassuming church. I mean, this, this building is very humble. Um, we don't have a parish hall. Uh, but I remember my husband and I would visit Santa Fe and we would go to the various churches and the people here were so friendly and just down to earth, what you see is what you get. And we liked that. I mean, we came here and people talked to us right away, you know, whereas some other churches you can go in. You never get to talk to anyone. So this too, if you judged it from the outside, who knows? Yeah, absolutely. You know? yeah. So you, so your first parish job was in the small place. What happened then? How long were you there? Yeah, so I was at St. Elizabeth's after ordination for maybe a year. And then I went to St. John of the Cross, which, um, was in Bristol, Indiana, close to the Michigan border. And I was there for three years. And then I was called to St. Anne's in Warsaw. Uh, and that was actually in the town I lived in, so that was great. And I was there for over six years. And then we, my husband and I were pretty burnt out and we wanted a new pace of life. And we had been coming to Santa Fe we thought maybe we'd go to Arizona, and it was just a matter of timing when he was ready and I was ready. It had to, <laughs> sometimes he was ready and I wasn't, and vice versa. And I had a sabbatical here, and he met me for the last week, and he said, let's go look at homes, and I said, what? And then we started planning, and I used Mary Oliver's poem, The Journey, to help me really make that journey from northern Indiana to Santa Fe, New Mexico, and it happened even quicker than I thought, and I really thought I'd take a break, and they needed someone here, and you know, when you visit and you try not to, you, I don't wear my collar or anything, I just try to go anonymous, but eventually, you know, they, they find out you're a priest, as and much as I try to hide trouble, it, yeah. and then, yeah, oh, well, we're looking for someone. And 
So but felt when you came here, you had come, you've been, you know, full time in parish mm-hmm. ministry in, in a variety yeah. of contexts, yeah. right, for a long time. Yeah. But when you came here, you didn't want it to be like that. No, and actually, St. John the Cross, we started and I was part time, and then we grew to three quarter time, and then we were looking at full time, and then I got called to St. Anne's. So, and then I had done the chaplaincy plus the church, so that's like more than full time. Yeah. Right? Uh, so, I have another vocation. Yeah, you gotta tell us about it. Uh, you want me to say yeah. that? Yeah. So, the year I was ordained, I also was certified to be a yoga teacher. And I really like the way, you know, mind, body, spirit, that works with the priesthood. And it seems like at times when church has been kind of down, yoga has been great, and vice versa. And so they balance each other out. And so I've been teaching yoga ever since, and it balances that out. And when I came here, I really did not, I thought I might take a break. I definitely didn't want to work full time. I wanted to teach yoga. And this has been a beautiful, beautiful fix for a really nice paced life. And I can do quality. I try to do you know quality over quantity. Uh, try to do it thoughtfully. We've built a great team here, uh, so it's it's not all me. And you know, when I was at St. Anne's, they had been used to having several clergy, so two priests and a deacon for a lot of that time. And now they're down to one, and so I know what that's like as well, right? To be the only person. To be the, the only, only person. To be the only person. That's that's you, used to you do everything. Yes, yes, yes. So it's it's a good mix, and um, you know I really do believe in kind of giving ministry away and building a team, and we've got a great group here. We're a happy lot. Um, and we have three priests, all female, not by plan. Uh, different backgrounds, uh, different experiences, different voices from the pulpit, which I love. Uh, I think it benefits everyone. Yeah. Well, yeah. one of the things you I want to talk some more about Holy Family and, mm-hmm. and particularly how you've grown. Yeah. Because Holy Family has really grown all through your time here while you have consistently not done what would normally happen in most churches, which is you came in at half time and then three yeah. quarter and then full. Like that you you have right. intentionally said right. that is not what that's not the plan. Right. And you have been able to successfully keep the boundaries between the part time. I mean yeah. I, I talk yeah. with a lot of clergy yeah. who are allegedly part time and they're really working full time plus. Yeah. Uh, because there isn't sort of a boundary there. So first, before we get into the Holy Family stuff, tell us your secret. How, how, do, you, how do you think about your life, kind of in a holistic way maybe, or, or how do you make sure that the job doesn't eat your lunch? Well, I've been there where it has. Uh-huh. So I, I've been some, there where it has. There's some experience uh, learning here. Yeah, yeah, so I can, you know, I can kind of feel it I can feel it in my body. I I know when it's going to be too much. But I do believe that the church is stronger and we're stronger when there are many of us doing the work instead of just one. I do know the pressure of just the one person doing it all. Uh, It's not healthy, it's not sustainable. Uh, I've gone on two credos, which which does help, you know, and just stepping back and, you know, years and years ago I read that great book called Margin. And that was so helpful, you know, the way when we grew up and we had that margin on the paper and as adults we fill all that up with no space left over. And why do we do that? Why do we do that? And I do it. And it seems like every time I move I start with a clean slate. Oh, I'm not going to do this again. And then a couple of years I find myself. Pile it all up. Yeah, on that treadmill. So, you know, you have to be pretty self-aware and you have to prioritize and know really what's essential. And sometimes I think at this point in my vocation, my, people probably won't like this, but my role is not to please people. Thank you. It's not to please. Can we say that louder? The priest's role is not to please everybody. It is not to please people, it is not. I mean, sure, does that make it better? Does it make it easier? Sure, absolutely. But 
that is not actually not my role. That's not what God's calling me to do. Mm -hmm. um, so there are going to be times when I disappoint, and that might I'm sure that was harder when I was younger and you know fresh into it. But by now, it's it's a reality, and I think this comes with experience, you know. And you know your limits, and in general, I think people are trying to do their best. Yep. Uh, volunteerism, I know across the board, is down since COVID. There are people who want to serve and want to give, and it's just kind of a matching that great quote. I think they credit Aristotle, where you know, your skills, talents, gifts match with the needs of the world. And if you can find that intersection, and I think if as clergy we can find that within individual people, so that's what I try to do. And I, you know, at this point I try to have two lunches a week with different people, and I listen, and what, what would they like to do? What are their gifts? Is, is there a place that they can use those gifts here? And then it's not all on me. And it's, and it's really helping with discernment. I mean, I think yeah. that, to me, that's one of the most important roles of clergy, which gets lost sometimes in the branch management uh -huh. of okay. stuff, you know? Uh, I, if you see yourself as, I lead the committees, and I drive the program, and I have the visionary with the answers, and I preach, and I do take care of everybody, then it all of a sudden gets really overwhelming. But part of what I think I hear in, in your, in what, the way you approach the ministry is, you understand yourself as helping the community do discernment yeah. about both what God is calling us to do, but then how are we going to do that, right? Like who is going to do what and how you like you listen to people who say, I want to do this or or you say, would you be interested? Yeah, in I do do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have a, uh, for instance, we have a seminary professor and I know that he has wonderful gifts and it was COVID and he couldn't really get out of the house very much and his wife is immunocompromised. And so, you know, I could teach the Bible study, but I just thought, I just put it out there and I said, and you know, put out the invitation. I said, would you be interested in teaching a Bible study? And he took to that, like, I mean, really, and he's great. And he's, I think we're on the third study and it's Wednesday nights, it's on Zoom. And it's great for everyone, meets their schedules, and now he gives, you know, and they receive, and I'm not the one teaching, it's another voice, so I can lead something else, and it's a win-win. So I think it doesn't hurt to just put out the invitation, and, and with no guilt, you know, and I always say, pray about it. Yeah. Like, even if someone is going to answer me right away, I say, why don't you pray about it? Because I do think, you know, sleeping on it, things look different in the morning, and, we all know what overcommitment can look like. Yeah. yeah, and there's a huge difference, right? If I've if I've said yes to a bunch of things that I'm not really committed to, yeah, that's draining. Yeah. If I say yes to the things that give me life, right, then in fact, even if it's tiring, you know, physically, yeah, spiritually, it gives me life, and, yeah. and so I, it's rewarding in a way that makes it worth doing. Yeah, and we just had this great gospel reading, right, where there are two sons, and one says. Yes, he's going to tend to the vineyard, and he doesn't. And the other one says no, and then changes, changes his mind and does. You know, so if hopefully we're excited and we're joyful. I mean, who wants to go to church if it's not joyful, right? Absolutely. So to match those gifts and to have people do things they really like to do. And I would imagine that sometimes that means not doing everything. Right. No. So, so tell me about, you had said earlier yeah. that... Part of what you do is kind of really focus on the things that are, I think the word you use is essential. Yeah. yeah. How do you tell within yeah. yourself, within your congregation, what's essential? So, like I did bring these flowers in today. <laughs> <laughs> so that I should have put those there. But, you know, we had a recent conversation about flowers and, uh, you know, if we don't have flowers on the altar, and like flowers are nice, they're not essential for worship. I know people are not going to like that either. <laughs> but it's true. But they're yeah. not. They're not. So. So to have a whole committee of people who are doing the flowers, if they love that and that's their right. ministry, that's a whole different thing from we have to have flowers. You have to do it. I know you don't like it, but suck it up. Actually, we just put up sign-up sheets. Yeah. And so people sign up, and if 
if there's a Sunday where there are no flowers, there are no flowers. And nobody feels responsible no. for going around to make sure that no. somebody signs up? No. Oh, what a blessing. Yeah, and it's the, <laughs> it's same, okay. thing. It's the right. same thing with hospitality. Yeah. You know, so there's a sign-up sheet. And amazingly, we've hospitality's been pretty full, so I think that tells me something. Yeah. A lot of people are signing up for one thing, but not for another. The values of our yeah. community are in this direction, yeah. right? And again, you're yeah. looking at that from a discernment. Angle. Yeah. You're, you're in the balcony, right? It, as that, right. that term is, the leader needs to be in the balcony occasionally to yeah. look at the whole picture. Like we did all these new chairs. This was during COVID. That was pretty risky. But we had people that had never been in the space who gave online and bought chairs. Wow. You know, so that tells me the spirit is doing something and that these chairs are a good and right thing, you know. But if you fired it up and it was really hard going, then right. we sit lightly to that and let yeah. it go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, I'm going to use the word model, not because it's the right word, because mm -hmm. I can't think of anything else right now. The, the, the way Holy Family has been structured, partly because when you came in and you said, I'm going to do, I'm going to teach yoga half time right. and I'm going to do priest half time yeah. and that's the way this is going to work and when the church grows yeah. I'm not going to stop doing yoga no. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to figure out other ways for this to yeah. work so tell tell us about kind of how that has gone yeah so uh, I see the yoga as a ministry mm -hmm. um, it's part of your vocation I mean I absolutely. see it as priestly too yeah yeah yeah, and, and I've had to change my teaching since moving here, so I have a lot of older students, and there's some chair yoga, we do a lot of balance, balance is really, I mean, research shows you can actually practice that and improve as you get older, so, you know, we meditate, we breathe, all these things that we do at those quiet moments in church, and hopefully in our prayer lives at home. You know, I've told, if the church needed a full-time priest, and they wanted a full-time priest, I was prepared to say, you know, I'm not that person. I mean, I really, Yeah. That's, that really is no skin off my back. And yeah. then, all of those things that you just said, I'm really okay with that, it yeah. really is no skin off my back. No. That shows such clarity of yeah. discernment within you, right? Yeah. What is Kareen, who is yeah. Kareen called to be? Right. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, and I know just from the past, like, you can tell when you're when it's too much. You know when it's too much. So, you know, being flexible enough to, at times when I'm covering for other teachers, I'm teaching a lot those weeks. At times, you know, in the church, there are certain things going on in the church. It's a lot those weeks. So to allow enough flexibility. And here's the thing: I need diversity. So I get bored. Yeah, I get bored sitting at a desk. I always, always, right after I got my degree, I mean, I really had a hard time just sitting at a desk. And I've always had two jobs, always. So I need some variety. I, I, I'm, I'm good at juggling different things. And I also need some creativity. So for me, this works. Yeah. That, and this works. And how do you know yeah. when it's too much? Because part of the reason I'm asking this is you, you say you can feel it in your body, yeah, I can. right? And I believe you. I can feel it in my body too, but I talk to a lot of clergy who get overwhelmed, yeah. and before they know it, they're fried. And yeah. and I think so. So t tell us how you know when it's starting to get too much, because it because it sounds like, yeah. and I'm sure it's not always the case that you're in perfect balance, but no. but you can feel it creeping up, and you can dial it back before yeah. it overwhelms. Right. So how how does that feel in your body, and how do you how have you learned that practice over time? I'm guessing yoga has something to do with it. It does. So does um, sitting, and at this point in my life, resting. Um, prayer time in the morning. I mean, that really. It's in those quiet moments where I can really hear if I'm a bit off off. Mm -hmm. And you know you can also tell when you're a little afraid and you don't respond to people right, or you know you're not as patient, or you're not as stable, you're not as uh, as calm, unanxious. You know, if we're supposed to be an unanxious presence, we know what it's like when we're anxious and when we're not. 
and when we're troubled and when we're not, and when we're in over our head and we're not. And so, I mean, I feel that very bodily. And, yeah. and yeah, I guess I don't know if I can describe it much more than that. But I also have a huge, and like you, you bike, I don't bike, but I am a big exerciser. So, you know, I, you swim, right? I swim a few days a week, I teach yoga, and I walk, and I lift, and I can't run anymore. But, you know, I'm, I'm always, that is such a great stress release for me. And then it gets my mind off of the work. And then I can see the work more clearly. Because I think when I've been the most out of sorts, were probably those early days when I was working all the time. Yeah. You know, when you're working all the time, that's all you know, and you just keep doing that. And I also do believe, and I know I've been here, a lot of clergy wait too long to take a sabbatical. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I have friends who have been in the ministry for 30 years. They retired before they ever took a sabbatical. Yeah. yeah. There are clergy like that here in the diocese. I mean, I've been in, I think this is year 26, almost finished. And I've only had two, which is not enough, but it's two more than a lot of people yes, that, it is. that I know. Yeah, yeah and, and so sabbaticals are good, credos are good. Um, I've been blessed, especially in Northern Indiana, with certain clergy groups. I have like three clergy groups, you know, and that's helpful. But I, you know, whatever it is for you to release stress, something you enjoy, I really enjoy exercising, so for some people that would be it. Right. Um, yeah, I'm the same way. When I'm, on, when I'm on the bike, there's enough going on with my body and with what's happening around me, the yeah. unfolding landscape yeah. as I climb that hill and descend, and that my, I don't have a lot of space to worry. Right. My attention is needed to not crash. <laughs> and, and please please stay focused you know, on the road. All of that. Yeah. yeah, stay focused on the road. But, but, it, but it allows me to kind of detach the frontal anxiety yeah. piece yeah. and let yeah. and let the, the yeah. deeper stuff happen yeah. which is which is great and for me the 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 things i know when i'm getting overstressed are i can't sit and pray uh -huh. i can right. I, I, like right. i feel the daily office like rushing yeah and when i get done with it i'm like okay what's the next time to yeah. do this? i i and i and i also notice that i can't read Anything uh -huh. except uh -huh. a, you know news news article. It's the same line and over and over. Yeah. And yeah, 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 yeah. Those are the signs to be like, man, you are yeah. close to being fried. And then the other the other thing that just started recently is I, I now train on the bike with a power meter and a heart rate monitor, okay. and those numbers uh -huh. sometimes I can tell uh -huh. based on the numbers that I'm over training. Sure. And and sure. sometimes it's not because I've been riding too much. Sometimes it's because I've been working too hard. Yeah. And and I'm learning to kind of recognize that kind of um, if riding a bike doesn't feel fun, it feels like hard. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a difference between like when you're exercising hard and it feels good, yeah. and when you're exercising hard and it's like, ugh. When I'm in that ugh place, I now know I gotta rest, not yeah. work harder, not solve all the problems, but but actually back off. But learning that, how do you back off, is something that I think a lot of clergy don't. We, we need to be taught or, or something. Yeah, and you have to be disciplined. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing I learned years ago, and I really try to do this, when I'm about to go on vacation, there's pacing, right? Ah, pacing. So, and I, think, I do think about running with this, that you've got this coming up, right? So actually vacation, because a lot of times we go, go, go all the way till the day of vacation. Then we go on vacation. Well, I'll speak about myself. Then, then I go on vacation, and I sleep, and I'm too exhausted. And then, by the time I'm finally rested, half the vacation's over, and then I start thinking about, you know, going back to work, right? Yeah, the re-entry starts coming. Right. So, and I can't remember if it was a spiritual director or who it was who told me. So I now pace that, and before, like a week out before I go on vacation, I really try to unload my calendar so I start tapering down wow, so this perfect. is something yep. so I start to taper down and then by the time I go on vacation I'm really ready and I even like the last two days before I would go don't have anything so just kind of sleeping and resting and yeah, yeah 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 and because yeah. there are gonna be things that come up yeah. but I don't have the other things on the calendar and then it's the same thing when I know I'm coming back so then you start ramping right but 
so I so the vacation is maybe only a week, but then with the tapering down. And then at the end, you know, it's another buffer. You, you give head. yourself a couple of days yeah. on the side, yeah, 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 yeah. to to ramp yeah. back up. Yeah. Right. And I would imagine that then you're more present, both as you step out and as you come back in. Mm -hmm. You know, because because I, mm -hmm. I can hear some folks might go like, well, but then you're you're basically expanding your vacation. No, no, actually, you're not. that's not what you're, you're doing. Not. In the same way that like for exercise, yeah. If you tap tape, if you taper before the event, you yeah. actually do the event. Right. Better. You do do it better. Then if you just kind of hammer your way into the event, it's not a good. It's not a good thing, right? So that. And then you come back to church. Yeah. With energy, I mean, you're you're ready to come back. Because you actually rested. You, you actually did. had a vacation. You, did. you didn't like yeah. have a have a nap. <laughs> and yeah. then and then reengage with your work. Yeah. So that's been helpful, but I. I like this idea of thinking about pacing. Yeah. With the clergy life, and and I feel like. Maybe this isn't true, but I feel like in the in another era, clergy had a different pace, where there were kind of like intense periods of Advent and Christmas, but then there were these kind of low seasons, and summertime when people too. all kind of, you know, it got slow and yeah. we didn't do all the programming in the summer and all that kind of stuff. And I feel like now it's on all the time, and it's and even when it's not on, you're planting like so. Summer we not we may not be doing all the programming, but we're planning all the programming at an intensive rate, you know, in a lot of churches that that, that people don't have the ebb and flow that that leads to health and creativity. I think that's probably where I'm a little bit different mm -hmm. too. I'm a Holy Spirit person, so like I have never been one of these people that can like go off seasons before and plan what I'm gonna preach on. You know, I, I can't go off in the fall and talk about what I'm gonna, you know, think about what I'm gonna preach in the epiphany or something like that, you know? Because I I often don't, you know, I write my sermons like on that Friday, sometimes Saturday, because something may have happened Thursday or Wednesday. Yeah. So I and that's just the way I work. It's like I, I'm a Holy Spirit person and I, I can't I just and I I am very organized, but I can't plan that far out. Mm -hmm. Because I have to allow enough margin for the Holy Spirit to do her thing, and and I'm always looking for stories and things in the Spirit, you know. So for me, that that works well. That works well. And there's wisdom in that too. I've I've, I've noticed that I have come to trust more the Holy Spirit in the moment of mm -hmm. preaching, for example, that um, I have less anxiety now than I used to, mm -hmm. right up until the moment, you know? Because I know the Holy Spirit's gonna do something. Right. And I trust that even if it's not what I would have felt comfortable with, it's probably what needed to happen and I need to like chill. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It, yeah. Chilling's a great a great thing. I think it was um, Desmond Tutu in that book of happiness that when we get older we should mellow. I like that. And that mellowing is a good thing and I think that's a wonderful idea. I love that. And I actually think if we mellow, we're more present. And I also think that multitasking is overrated. Mm -hmm. Another thing people won't like. Well, but they say it's that you never actually do that, right? Yeah. And that every time, what, what is it? I think the current thinking is that every time you switch from one task to the next, even if you think you're multitasking, you're actually monotasking. And every time you switch, it takes like 17 seconds for your brain to re-engage. Okay. So, so that you're actually burning time. Uh -huh. as you, You're not being more efficient by doing more things at once. It would actually be much more efficient if you just did the one thing and then right. did the other thing instead of like, this thing, lose 17 seconds, this thing, lose 17 seconds, this thing, back to that, lose 17 seconds. And so every time we pick up a phone, right. every time we say yes, you know, hello, someone comes in the church office, like every one of those interruptions breaks the flow, which we then have to reestablish. So, and this is where I think yoga is helpful mm. because we start class and we sit and we focus on our breath. And I mean, I'm doing with this with groups. I don't. It's not daily, but it's close. And all eight, you know, all ages and sitting and almost closing your eyes. You know, looking at a spot and focusing on your breath. 
and noticing, okay, is my breath going into my neck, my chest, my ribs, or my belly? And for most of us, it's not in the belly. And you can tell when you're anxious and you're rushed, it's here. And that's not a good place for it to be. Yeah, yeah, it's you know, yeah. So slowing down and bringing it lower in your body is so calming. You know, and I think, you know, when Jesus prayed and, and, and he, he goes up to the mountain, I mean, he's, that calming, you know, that, that I think doing that is so helpful, and I think we're better leaders that way. Absolutely. And I, part of what the church needs the priest to bring is that mellowness. It's, yeah. it's the calm, right? It's yeah. the, it, vision is overrated, I think, as a kind of business plan related mm -hmm. vision, whereas to me, vision is that balcony kind of peaceful, calm, discernment kind of vision as seeing what the Holy Spirit is doing, what she's up to, rather than vision as my plan for right. you. Because <laughs> you know? how can you see what she's doing when you're so caught up in yeah, your own vision? Your own plans. Yeah. So, and I'm sure if there were people who were watching this who knew me a while back, there I was, <laughs> you know, but I long for more time in my life and more space in my life. And that is so important to me that I'm preserving it. I'm trying to keep that margin. And what that also means is that, you know, sharing the work with others, you know. And this is a great segue because I wanted to shift to talk about so the way Holy Family has been structured and the way it works is that you're here part-time. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two other priests here, right? kind of even more part-time. Yep. Yep. Um, and this is a congregation that is experiencing tremendous growth in all areas. Average side attendance, the membership, and the finances. Mm -hmm. um, and, and all of that is happening not because you're working harder and harder and harder no. yourself, not because you're going from part-time to full-time, but because you're intentionally not. Right. <laughs> and and, it, and you, you said to me yesterday that it's because you give ministry away. Yeah, I really, I really believe that's my role right now. I, I believe that so, so much. Um, what does that mean to you? As you a leader, know, as a priest, to give ministry away. So it's like someone, someone this week needed a pastoral visit and one of the clergy had said she'd really like to visit that person. And the person had contacted me, right? And so I contacted the, the clergy person, I said, would you like to visit them? And so I stepped, I stepped back and I let her visit the parishioner, even though the parishioner contacted me. You know, and I explained that, you know, they would like to visit you. And so I think that's, you know, almost being a bridge and bridging people and opportunities. People to people and then people to opportunities, right? And because it's not about me, and I think that takes experience. You know, it's like, man, I don't know if I ever thought it was about me, but, but with more experience, less and less about you, right? And um, Ronald Rollheiser talks about this at the end of life, that we, you know, Jesus gave his life away, but he gave his death away. And that at the end of our lives, you know, you have the first half of life and the second half, and then at the end, that we, we give our lives away and we give our deaths away. And to be an example of that, you know. And, and really, I, I just feel like instinctually, and, Holy Spirit-wise, God-wise, that's what I meant to do right now. And so I kind of try to be a bridge and join people to people and opportunity and step back. And there's plenty, of, there's some, there's plenty of work for all of us to do. It's like, I don't have to do it all, you know? And like, there's no reason to be hoarding it or whatever. I mean, it just, there's, when we have new people come, you know, and sometimes we'll have new clergy come and they're sitting there, it's like, I, there's room for everyone. I mean, I can't, it would be, it wouldn't make any sense for me to say there's no place for you, there's no work for you to do here. I mean, there's plenty. I mean, the vineyard's huge, right? Yeah. The harvest is plentiful, right? And so, yeah, that's just where I'm at, to kind of step back and be a bridge and, and give it away. And, 
Yeah. Sometimes I feel like clergy get stuck in two ways. One sort of, I feel responsible for doing it, whatever it is, uh -huh. right? Making sure that the flowers are here and the candles are lit and all that stuff. So I, I need to do it. Or I think the, the other trap. I think a lot of clergy would say, "It's never about me. I don't want it to be about me." But they make it about me in the sense that there is this unwritten kind of, "We pay you to do that." Right. And right. so people clergy get sucked into the, yeah. the sense of obligation to do things, which isn't coming from them. It's because of the implied contract that, uh -huh. they're, that they're working on with the congregation. And, so and I get that. And I help okay. you kind of. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we're videotaping right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll be done in just a minute. Oh, so we're going to have one go down before the other. Okay, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> So I think that sometimes clergy kind of, part of what I really love about the way you approach the ministry is it, you are cultivating and nurturing a community, inviting other people to take initiative, and, and really seeing that, I mean, you're, you're nurturing this thing, you're paying attention to everybody and where the energy is, and, I mean, it's, it's active ministry, um, but it's subtle in the sense that it's not all visible what you do, right? And probably, I guess you'd have to ask them. Yeah, <laughs> well, but I think I would guess that what people experience is there's room for me. Oh yeah, so that's what I want them to experience. There's passion yeah. for me to explore. Yeah. And and we get to be in this yeah. together. You yeah. Know? And, and I yeah. think that that would be a um, that becomes an exciting group to be a part of, right? Exciting church to be. In. And I do think at times you have to leave the holes empty. That's so. Okay. You know, like the flowers. So then there are no flowers, and no one needs to feel guilty. It's fine. I mean, there's it, it, God. Oh, this is probably not people are like God isn't more praised with or without flowers, really. I mean, they're lovely, but you know. So I think sometimes we have to leave the holes. We have to leave the spaces, and maybe they'll be filled, and maybe not. Maybe the energy will be elsewhere. Yeah. You know, and. Um, and, and this church has had different ministries, as all churches have, you know, and, and different partnerships. And, and you're letting ministries die when they need to. Oh, yeah. Instead of, I think a lot of churches yeah. also, a lot of clergy are like, well, that thing can't stop because we've been doing it for 20 years. Well, maybe even for 20 years it's time to stop, right? Right, exactly, exactly. And COVID kind of gave us a pause, right? Mm -hmm. Shouldn't that have given us all a pause? Like. And, and I, I think for a lot of us, we stepped back and we thought, okay, what's really important? I know I did. And, you know, just step back and what really matters? And those are so, that's such a healthy question. For vestries to think about too, right? Yeah. I mean, if part of the leadership task is to nurture those questions, instead of sort of coming in with an agenda and here's the, or, you know, this is the August meeting, so in the August meeting we always do that. Right. But instead to see your role as the priest coming in to say, what is essential in this season for us? What, where is the Holy Spirit moving? Let's talk about that, right? That is, that's a different flavor of leadership. It's a really healthy one. Well, thank you. Yeah, and we're in different seasons. I'm in a different season. Yeah. yeah. You know, so... I don't, and I don't know if eyes around the corner. I mean, that's the exciting thing. And people come with new ideas, and then we see if they stick. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah, it's it's a healthy place right now. It's a happy lot, and I think why wouldn't you want to go to church if it's joyful and and you get a good feeling and you there's a place for you. You know, so and it's happened pretty organically. Some intention. It seems to me that the intention comes from nurturing the organic process. Kind of. yes, in, in the sense that you're paying attention to the process, right? You're not worried so much about driving towards this outcome or that no. outcome. You are focusing as the priest of the community as 
My job is to tend the, the, the process. And, and thus, it grows where God wants it to grow. Exactly. And you know, when I came here, the space looked very, very different. Our congregation looked different. We have people who were parishioners then, have been longtime parishioners, but we have new parishioners and everything in between. But I can honestly say I never worry about this place as a community because I just, it's in God's hands and it'll be what it'll be. And, and it's, it's been awesome to see what happens. I it's, 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 who would have thought? Really, who would have thought? Yeah. Great. Thank you for this ministry. Thank, Thank you for you. the example that you've set and for this model, which for, for us in the Diocese of the Rio Grande, um, we are not going to be able to have a full-time priest in every building. We still don't today. Uh, but you're showing us that with your team and by giving ministry away and by leading in this way, that the Holy Spirit will come in and, and churches can grow, uh, even without the old bottle. So thank you for that. Well, thank you, and I do have to say, there's a great team here. Well, yeah. tell us about the team, because we have, I mean, yeah. we, let's take a minute to talk about how you build the team and nurture the team, because that's important. That, that is, um, and I can't remember when it first happened, but uh, we had uh, Deacon Pat Masterman was in this diocese at that point, and she was looking for a place to land, and we met, and, and right around then, Penny was looking for some field dead, and we met, and was looking for a place to land. Sure. And you know, and then uh, Mother Kathy, you know, retired and was looking for a place to land. And, you know, I kind of met with her, and I said, well, you know, at this point in your vocation, what would you like to do? You know, and she'd like to preach every now and then and celebrate. So she preaches once a month, and she celebrates once a month. And what we do, so what, I, what we've done here is we split the service. So a, there's the Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Table. So every Sunday, except if two people are on vacation, there are two priests. And the one is doing the Liturgy of the Word and preaching, and the others celebrating the Eucharist Liturgy of the Table. And so we're able to really share the role and we have different voices, you know, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful fit. And if something happens in our lives, which has in the last year, all of us with some personal loss or struggles with our families, we're able to cover for each other. And so we really are like a team, and it's just been wonderful. And I put together the Rhoda, and, and it's, it works beautifully. And it was, again, just listening to people. and. What do they want to do? There's plenty of work here. So instead of one person, three priests doing it all, we split it in two. And then even at times, sometimes the second Sunday of the month, we have healing. So the third priest can do the healing. So that's, we've done that. You know, so it's, it's sharing it instead of the one priest doing it all. And I don't see that as a loss. I see that as a win. And in a congregation this size, a lot of people would think, uh, in a lot of our churches, congregation this size would only have one part-time priest right. and they'd be and they the reason they would feel overwhelmed is you're the part-time priest but you're expected to do everything for everybody yeah. about everything and and one of the benefits you get from a larger church is there are multiple voices but part of what you've been able to demonstrate is you can make that happen because <laughs> this congregation as it continues to grow has multiple voices multiple people engaged and the the lay leaders also, you keep giving, you know, you know, giving it away for them too, giving the ministry to them. Yeah, and I think it's healthy that they see, like, this Sunday, I mean, usually I'm in one of those roles, but this Sunday I'm not. And so I'm actually going to be sitting in the pews, and I think that's good for them to see, you know. And it'll be good for me to experience too, you know. It's been a while since I've done that. Yeah. So, but we've been so blessed, you know, the Holy Spirit has just brought the deacon or the priest one after another and I keep thinking oh my gosh you know and then when one of them leaves I'm thinking oh but then that, then another one came and it's just like oh my goodness it's, so that's been really awesome it's, and then when you know when that starts to happen you, you really don't worry I'm not expecting it but I'm not as surprised when it does because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's about trust 
which again is the model for if the priest isn't trusting in God to help carry the day, then how will the congregation ever believe it? <laughs> well, thank you. Thank, thank you for your ministry and for this time. It's been a really wonderful. Thank you for your visit. Okay. That should be plenty. <laughs> oh, it's great. It's great. It's great. It's great.